when we last spoke, it was in the middle of the left's fight over this idea of force the vote. And while some people are going to cringe that I am, yes, still talking about it a year, a year later, the reason why so many on the left were so viscerally committed to this was because it was one of the few moments where a very small number of um, House members could actually exert sincere power, not just the kind of begging Biden to do something, but yeah, the ability yeah. to say, I'm going to withhold something that the party wants and needs, Nancy Pelosi speakership, over some really hardcore concessions that Nancy Pelosi has in her personal power to extend, like yeah. um, whether it's a vote mm -hmm. on Medicare for all, whether it's certain committee appointments that they crowed mm -hmm. were going to come because of playing nice. Playing nice, begging, didn't actually get them the results that they claimed no, no, playing nice yeah, was going to yeah. get. So now we have kind of proof positive. We A lot of us at that moment were like, we're going to be disappointed. Because that was in some ways the lowest the stakes were ever going to be in terms of the trade off between being able mm -hmm. to give things to your constituents, do things for your constituents and like risking it for something bigger. Right. The only downside is Nancy Pelosi isn't Speaker of the House. Who cares? So what? Right. It's not like, OK, I hold up the Build Back Better bill and people don't get, you know, two thousand dollar checks or they don't get. Um, child tax credits or whatever it is, right? At this point, the, the risks were so low and the progressives' unwillingness to do it really was a bad omen for a lot of people on the left. And over the course of the last year, it feels, and I take no joy in this, but it feels like we were proven aggressively right. And so I want to know, I want to hear what your view of this is, because my concern is that going into midterms, going into 2024, all of this institutional memory of how right the left was at the very beginning, or at least some parts of the left were at the very beginning, or it's going to go out the window. And we're going to get a lot of thought leaders who command a lot of respect, including Professor Chomsky, saying again, despite all of the evidence that Joe yeah, Biden yeah. hasn't done what was necessary to address the climate crisis and yeah. myriad other crises, that at very, you know Trump is worse, you know, it's lesser of two evils, you got to fall in line. How do we break out of that dynamic? I don't know, but uh, again, that's the big question. But what I, I will tell you my conclusion. But I still think, even if we skeptics were proven right, it was nonetheless not a mistake to give Biden and people around him a chance. Because now nobody can accuse us of being that kind of dogmatic sectarian leftist who just comfortably like you and me with all the books and wait for the big revolution, but just denounce all proposals. No, we acted honestly. We played an extremely, we who said, okay, allow Biden, if he can, to do something good. It's very, we gave him a chance. And uh, as you beautifully said, we are not now enthusiastic that we were proven right that Democrats didn't meet it. But it's very important if we want in the long term to achieve, I don't know what, anything, that we are not perceived as these usual academic radicals who are very quick to denounce every measure as a compromise. No, we should. Now this will shock you. I, you know that I like this almost perverted perverse line, but I think I'm correct. In this crazy situation in which we are today, we are the moderate common sense realists. The measures that we should insist on this, those in power are playing with our faith. They, yes. are, they are crazy. That That's true. That's true. But it is also something true. Something bothers you. Strike back. The, the, regardless of how measured we are in our early critiques, regardless of how much we frame the issues as we want Joe Biden just to fill his campaign promises. I'm not rooting against Biden, right? That's the posture that I took. I'm not rooting for Biden, Biden to fail. I'm rooting for him to succeed. I'm warning him as what's going to happen down the pike. Regardless of the moderation of my own tone, I am still, and people who took this approach are still yeah. characterized as radicals. And at the same time, I would argue the fact that no one out there is speaking more radically and truthfully about what's going on and willing to say this is actually corruption afoot, that Joe Biden, of course, is not going to do the right thing. He hired Steve Reschetti, a former oil lobbyist, as his senior advisor. He's got Cedric Richardson from the most polluted district in America as a senior advisor. We know we know what this game is. He, we, he told him that, you know, he said in the leaked meeting to a bunch of 
um, donors, nothing would fundamentally change. Like the fact that there were that that at that level of tone, that level of analysis wasn't a bigger part of the conversation enabled the corporate media to get away for the last 10 months with pretending like Biden was going to be something he wasn't. And only now people are reaching out to me for interviews talking about, oh, well, what, what could he do now? What should the left say? I'm like, where were you? Six months ago, when you were writing screeds about how Biden was going to be the next FDR and casting people like myself as completely unreasonable, disgruntled Bernie bros. You know, there's a time and a place for this kind of criticism. And now it's all too late. And this is what happens. The media will open itself up to the kind of criticism that is necessary after the fact. I maybe appear too much of a conformist for you, but my (laughs) counterpoint would have been not even counterpoint. I agree with you. Did we have a choice? Unfortunately, but correct me immediately if I'm wrong. Uh, as I put it cynically, you can even correct me if I am right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but don't you think that not doing this, not pretend to, even if we know how it will come out, not to pretend to give Biden a chance, wouldn't change anything we would just not only appear as sectarians who even wanted Biden to fail, it would even be possible to blame us. You know that you see you contributed to this, you were too tough and so on and so on. But that's we, the thing. I think we can, we were not, we never, as you pointed out nicely, we just say, okay, she's saying some things which in present desperate constellation are not totally bad, let's see what he will do. We so, never crossed that fateful line into AOC. Like, I, I, I agree with you. And I, that's why, I mean... Choice? Being I, I, totally skeptical from the look, beginning... I did it. Worse. Right, like, I, I did the thing that you, you're yeah. arguing for. So obviously, on some level, I thought that was the best approach. I guess my frustration is that there is no lefter flank. There, I, I don't think that me and all of my bourgeois sensibilities should be anywhere close to the left flank of discourse happening in this country. And it, it frustrates me that there aren't people somewhere. You know, I have a certain level of for lack of a better word, like political credibility that I think is valuable on its own that I want to protect. But somebody somewhere, it seems to me, should be making the much harder line argument, especially members of the press who have access to people like Jen Psaki, who recently caused another little firestorm over student loan debt. This is not something that's going away. Because again, to your point, this is something that was a Biden campaign promise. And then in the left, in all of its measured reasonableness, hasn't been broadly saying, okay, Joe Biden cancel all student debt. We all know he never promised that, but he did promise to cancel $10,000 for everybody and full debt cancellation for everybody who makes $125,000, under $125,000 a year and went to a public university. That has been memory hold. Nobody's talking about that in the public sphere. And unfortunately, the press secretary is able to get up and get away with Joe Biden not fulfilling that very basic campaign promise and instead turning student loan payments back on in an election year, at the same time that the child tax credits are ending. And she gets away with it because reporters refuse to ask her. They they assume it, they don't will refuse to assume in the question that Biden has the authority to cancel student debt, which of course he does. So Jin Sakin can get away with saying for months, oh, we're waiting for an advisory letter. And then when the advisory letter got leaked, entirely redacted, by the way, but the existence yeah, of the yeah, letter yeah. the letter has existed since April. Then the pivot was to, oh, well, there's no bill on my desk. A bill on your desk, the whole point of this is, is that it's something you can do by executive order. But because the questions aren't framed as such, because the questions aren't framed in a more adversarial, visceral way, she will probably get away with this until February 1st, at which point our, we will all be paying our debts again, unless there is a debt strike. Mm-hmm. And she will be saying, oh, well, we can't reverse it. It's already a done deal. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that sometimes I think we don't realize that another level of discourse and aggression is necessary until it's too late. And everyone thinks they can do this consensus building. And and, and, and even, even though I'm an outsider, even though so many of us in the left media are outsiders, we're still behaving as though we're playing an inside game like we are AOC. No, I agree with you. And I will add here, I think we will agree two points concerning all this. First, uh, a more general critical point. 
uh, which in today's situation, where I really think, I don't want to take too much of your time, by this I've written a short uh, text, I didn't forget where it was uh, published, but uh, you know what's happening today? I really think that it's not a dream. There is on the horizon clearly a war, a war either in Europe around Ukraine and in the Far East, Taiwan, China. And that's another question. I also have to criticize Putin, criticize the Chinese. It's, I, I list all the problematic things China is doing, this new wave of uh, repression, nationalist rhetorics, uh, boosting the military. It, it's very interesting to see, I just saw some clips, China just put on the market their biggest movie hit. It earned in China itself almost one billion, which celebrates a foreign intervention of China into North Korea and so on. But I'm not just blaming China or Putin. You know where uh, Biden totally follows Trump and goes even further in his boycott of China, in his anti-Chinese policy? In what sense? I think a very simple analysis. United States still have a more or less monopoly on software, hardware, digital space, all those companies and so on. And it wants absolutely to retain this monopoly. Europe can do it, nobody else. China is the only competitor. I find this so horrible, how the whole situation is slowly I will not bore you again with all the details, but some of the details are fascinating. It's uh, how, on the one hand, China is right to feel encircled more and more. On the other hand, China is getting ready. Like, I have a friend in China with whom I communicate, and he sends me emails through foreign links. He's afraid things are censored there. But they don't regularly now in Chinese military journals who are still not secret journals, public debate of how military should be organized in China. They regularly mention that the United States has one advantage with regard to China. They always were engaged in small wars, like small, mm -hmm. not total wars, like Afghanistan, Iraq, to train their army in real battle experience, while Chinese didn't. The last was that short intervention 40 years ago or when. It didn't work well into Vietnam to punish it for invading uh, Kampuchea. So they claim we need a real battle. We need a small war and all other symptoms. It's, and that very mysterious this is things that made me afraid. Did you notice this news? It was not secret. It was in all the media in China. The government called on ordinary people, families, that in view of, they didn't specify a possible chaos, troubles, that every family should gather at home, provide themselves with food supplies for at mm. least two months. There are dark things, and but my point is I'm not simply blaming China here. I think... The whole situation, and even with Ukraine, where the thing appears to be clear, like Putin wants to expand, but it's not as simple as that, because I remember, you are too young, I'm unfortunately not, how when the Soviet Union fell apart, there was a clear deal between Russia and the West. Russia, Yeltsin at that point, accepts the disintegration of Soviet Union into autonomous, fully sovereign republics on condition that, on condition that the West solemnly promised that none of these new states will join NATO. The West is breaking this promise also. So it's, and now this is what really disappoints me. One would have thought, you know, that, that, that the, Logic would be, my God, we are now fighting an epidemic and then global warming, at least wars and this then. No, 
usually we have a stupid saying in Slovene, when the devil has children young, they, he usually had a lot of them in one small period, no? It's as if that, uh, precisely because we are in such a global crisis, uh, uh, crisis, sorry, there is even a greater danger of war. And this makes me a uh, pessimist. But back to, back to, uh, back to your point, uh, uh, Biden and so on. What I still don't see is, okay, I'll put it like this so that I don't get confused. Uh, nonetheless, don't be all in all too much of a, just of a pessimist. I begin with this, then I will make the pessimist conclusion. <laughs> don't you think that the fact that we have now even that we even have this debate, we have a little bit at least more serious left, which is limited, but nonetheless a political agent. And we can debate, should we strategically support some of things Biden is doing, others not, means that things are moving slowly somewhere. But that's not quite the debate, um... Slavo, I, I don't feel like there's anybody on the left who's ever really been antagonistic to anything on Biden's agenda. The, the, there is nobody. And this is part of my point. Maybe there should be someone who was kind of radically out there rooting for Biden to fail. But on the whole, everyone would be there, there are so many people on the left who would be the first to stand in line and bend the knee and congratulate the guy for doing the bare minimum. And he won't even do what he has professed he would do. And we, the left is being still blamed, to your earlier point, for any failure. The left will be blamed for the losses in 2022. Claire McCaskill and all of them are already testing their excuses for how somehow the completely neutered and uh, inexistent, non-existent left is going to be to blame for this. And so what do we have to show for our restraints? I see, no, no. I see your point, and I will even go further. Now comes my pessimist conclusion. That, uh, as you were justified to point out, what I fear is that in uh, 2024, it will be the same emotional as it were blackmail. They will say, yes, Biden didn't do it all, but listen, do you want Trump back? And we will be blackmailed into again, like, and I'm aware of this. That's why you remember I was almost cursed by Chomsky and all of them, when I said uh, maybe it's better for the left for Trump to win. I wouldn't say this again in 2024, because who knows what I think that I'm much more of a pessimist in the sense that not only in United States, but all around, that there are simply signs that a basic social Pact in the sense of a civil order is slowly disintegrating, that this is a very speculative thesis, that we are moving into a new tribal societies where, like, isn't it clear that, uh, and I agree here with you, isn't it clear that uh, with Trump people, extreme, all these conspiracy theorists and so on and so on, it's nonsense to say we need a dialogue with them. No, ultimately, somebody will have to win. Some people would say that the extradition of Julian Assange is evidence that there is an alignment when it comes to some of the most coercive, anti-free speech, fascistic elements that Trump had with Biden. And you've written in your book, what did you? how do you put it, um, that Biden is Trump with a nice face or something along those lines? I don't want to misquote you. No, no, but, I, I refer, sorry, I refer to that old ironic idea when progressives in the 60s, 70s were calling for socialism with a human face. With a human face. And okay. I say that Biden is Trump with a human face. Right. Now, would you agree? I would, sorry to interrupt. Now, I would say even the opposite, that if we say, use the term human in the sense of all the vulgarity of everyday Manners, when you relax, you get drunk, you are vulgar. It's almost that Trump is Biden with a human face. In Trump, you get all these dirty jokes, vulgarity. Biden is just more controlled. Everything is controlled. He is, uh, uh, and so, but you know, uh, uh, 
Nonetheless, I don't, I'm a little bit here more optimist than you. I think that if the left should draw this conclusion, of course, that to really not bring a change, but at least keep the space open for the change which is needed, that it cannot be done within the hegemonic political space, Democrats, Republicans, and so on and so on, that we have to step out somehow. But it's nonetheless important how to do this. That's my obsession. Well, how, how, do, how do we do that? Because that is also my obsession as well. It's not... Here comes, okay, okay, we should do everything. I was clear here. I support sincerely, not because some calculations. I support, uh, that's incidentally, I think it's in the book, in this book, my favorite moment where I unite philosophy with everyday political analysis. Why Black Lives Matter are more universal than All Lives Matter. All Lives Matter appear universal, but they are a fake because this all is already overdetermined by white standards and so on. To be universal today, you have to say Black Lives Matter because they are, uh, I even believe here in the deep lesson of so-called, how are they called, Afro-pessimists and so on. Is this Afro-pessimists, you know, Mm -hmm. those guys who claim that uh, uh, anti-black racism is not the same as other racism, it's at a more basic level. But don't you think that if we want our speech to have any effect, now I will expose myself, you should attack me, that if we want our speech to have any effect, we should endlessly repeat this point, that first, what we want are not some eccentric remarks, oh, communism, new communist party, whatever. We just basically want to take seriously what those, even those in power, are forced under pressure of circumstances to announce as their goals. For example, take, which was for me mega fiasco, take the Glasgow conference. What they were saying there, yeah, it's true. We need, it was the scandal now with Omicron, which becomes clear. The scandal is triple. First, in some European countries, they, they have now even too many vaccines, and since their, how do you call it, date of use is over, they are destroying them. Nobody thought at least this, that before the date was reached, let's keep them quickly to third world countries. There was no serious cooperation. Third thing, they are saying this, those in power. What about free licensing? No copyright for the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And you can get even a very good logical pro-capitalist even justification for this. Because as we know, the private corporations, pharmaceutical, got billions of dollars of state support for developing vaccines. Why? Why don't they owe something? Society, they will still earn enough and so on and so on. So what I would have done, is this too compromising for you, is to insist we are not some madman importing some crazy radical notion. Look, you are admitting that this is needed. Not to mention even global warming. People know there has to be international cooperation. There will be food crisis and so on. We should emphasize that we are not radical madmen. We address common sense. Right. And, I, and I'm with you. And that's what we've all been doing. And look what happened. Somebody, somebody asked recently, Jen Psaki at a press conference, why we can't ship tests to every American. She scoffed and laughed at the idea like it was completely absurd and said, how much would this cost? And when the reporter pointed out that other countries managed to do it all over the world, yeah. she says, well, yeah. we share the same values and goals. We're just going to get about a diff- go about it differently. Meanwhile, biggest military budget in American history. No one's asking how we're going to pay for it. So my point is not that I disagree with that approach. We've all, my point is that we've all been taking that approach and it hasn't been working. And so what I, I and I and I want to ask about your optimism because in your book you you talk about how even Demos and the the yellow jackets the jaune vests they there were these moments 
where they seem to be having uh, be riding on a real wave of radical potential change. And then there was this moment where they were af- actually given a voice within parliament. And in your telling, that effectively neutered or took a lot of the air out of the energy of the movement. No, the tragical even... fate for me is Podemos in Spain. Mm-hmm. You remember three, four years ago, hundreds of thousands of people, incredible uh, mobilization. Now they are just one very modest, uh, traditional, but modest social democratic party. Right. You know what's my, okay, let me provoke you further. Okay. I say something horrible. Uh, <laughs> that, so that you will see that I'm not a fake optimist, like let's support Biden, something will come out of it. Okay. Uh, I think the way we screwed it up, we simply are not yet there desperate enough. I'm not a leftist fanatic, like some of my leftist friends, I will not name them, even claim the only thing would be to maybe even provoke some catastrophe, explode an atomic and nuclear plant or whatever. Mm. No, but uh, obviously, and I don't worry that this will not happen. Obviously, you know what's the problem? Sorry that I jumped. The problem is that in old Marxist way, I'm still basically a Marxist, but a critical one. In the old Marxist way, we were used to trust history. History is on our side, moving in progress and so on. No, I don't think so. I think that the global development today goes towards a suicidal catastrophe. And we have to act in a voluntary, voluntarist way. By voluntarist, I mean We just have to do something to prevent a catastrophe. I always quote that Walter Benjamin, the task of the progressive forces today, it's not to ride the train of history, but to pull the, how do you call it, brake. So what's what's pulling the brake? Have you been following any of the third party movements, the Andrew Yang deciding to put his energy behind starting uh, starting a third party and focusing on um, ranked choice voting and ballot initiatives? What do you mean? You know what? Uh, I was always skeptical about this, like Podemos and social movement and so on. But again, I don't know enough about the United States, but we even in Slovenia and in other European countries, now, uh, apart from the official corrupted left, which is no left, our version of Biden's and so on, there is an incredible awakening of, I don't like this name, is so much misused, but civil society. Civil society can also be extremely corrupted. Fascism began as a civil society movement. But things can, for example, in Slovenia, uh, the government wanted to change the law regulating where on the source of rivers and see can you build can you construct new buildings? Why? So it would be a catastrophe. It would be very profitable, but a catastrophe for uh, for uh, for clean water and so on and so on. You know what happened? Everybody thought this will be 10, 20,000 people. It was incredible. It was 70, 80% of the people voted. The highest turnout. Turnout. It was just a referendum and mm-hmm. government lost by around 85% against. Now, my fear is that this will remain one issue, point of mobilization. The big task is to politicize them in some way, like to find a way to retain. This is where Greek, Greek, uh, Syriza in Greece failed. The moment after the compromise with EU, that they took power, they destroyed their entire uh, civil society base, all those autonomous non-governmental organizations. Here I see, maybe I'm too optimist, but there are signs that this is possible. And uh, some of these organizations, they are moving in this direction. You know, in the sense that they don't want just to become another party, but they want to influence the elections. There are now a couple of groups in Slovenia which are very strong locally, and they decided to avoid totally this big debate, not against global warming. But do you, 
are you, they are asking the parties, are you for or against a new nuclear plant? Do you, what is a minimal wage and so on? All these demands, they are just moving to concrete topics and this mobilizes people. So I'm not afraid that nothing will happen. My God, look what's happening already in the United States. Don't you think that at a certain point, with with uh, with a uh, pandemic and even more with global warming and all these catastrophes up and down, people will be shattered. And at that point, maybe we have... Yeah, I, I think that people are already fed up. And I think that when you talk about politicizing issues, the right is doing a very good job of it. That's COVID, the problem. That will COVID, be the big COVID, problem. COVID in particular, I think we're only seeing the beginning of the extent to which this is the litmus test for conservative candidates. We recently did an episode on a TV personality named Dr. Oz, who's running for Senate in Pennsylvania, largely towing, charting a new path forward between, somewhere between COVID skepticism and vaccine, uh, you know, COVID skepticism and kind of a pharmaceutical skepticism, which I think a lot of Americans across the, the aisle feel. And so liberals identifying themselves so strongly with the I believe in science, don't question me, Dr. Fauci is king message, yes. forecloses, I think, a lot of really organic and sincere skepticism uh, of the corporate nature of the pharmaceutical industry and the exploitative history of it that everyone understands and when are being gaslit now about, because to acknowledge that is in some ways to be seen as being an anti-vaxxer or siding with the right. Meanwhile, the right is now given this huge opportunity to take a kind of pseudo, you know, anti-corporate, pseudo-populist posture that also neatly dovetails with a kind of anti vax sentiment that is already existing on the right. Yep. And there are there's no end to how many benefits that's going to pay off. But to your point in the book, it does feel like there are two, there, there are there are almost there are three parties. There's a neoliberal center. Yep. There's a, 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 a leftist small little flint of a fragment. What? And there is an alignment between the far right and the center right in a way that makes it inordinately more powerful. And given and that is why there's so much focus and why I'm so obsessed with the idea that there needs to be a more serious conversation had about how to budge the neoliberal left and to co-opt the neoliberal left the way that the far right had managed to do to the neoliberal right. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.